So our challenge program has a global reach. We work in nine major river basins in the world. Uh, in Asia, the uh, Ganges, the Mekong, the Yellow River, the Karkain Aran. In Africa, the Volta, the Nile, and the uh, Limpopo. And in Latin America, a, a San Francisco basin in Brazil, and a series of basins in the Andes. In all of these, we're looking at how water access for poor farmers can be improved and how water productivity in agriculture can be increased so that more water can be made available for other purposes. The common goal is actually a common challenge and the challenge is water scarcity and food security. Uh, this began several years ago as a response to the realization that we're going to have trouble growing enough food for growing populations with higher incomes with the kind of water being allocated to agriculture, irrigation, rain fed, and so on. Where is go the water going to come from to feed the future populations? Uh, and what was realized is that in much of agriculture, water productivity, the amount of output you get per liter of water uh, used or depleted in, in food production, is actually very, very low. And so if we can do something about water productivity and more equitable access for farmers uh, of different uh, social classes for, uh, to water resources, then we can address this challenge. You can improve food security and uh, with the kind of water resources available, still making enough water available for cities, for ecosystem services, uh, for industrial use, and so on. One way to increase water productivity is to allocate water from lower value uses to higher value uses, going for higher value crops. Another way, however, might be to allow enough water for urban services, but having urban water consumers compensate upland farmers for good water management uh, by investing perhaps in livelihood improvements for poor farmers in the uplands. So it's a win-win situation. Another way to improve water productivity would be to find ways to have seemingly conflicting enterprises actually be able to work together. Water productivity in much of the developing world's agriculture, and especially in rain-fed areas, is actually very, very low. If you take the Volta, it seems like a dry basin. You find it's in the Sahel and so on. But actually, the rainfall is quite substantial. It's just not being used by the crops. It isn't going through crops to produce food. Uh, a lot of this has to do with how the runoff uh, happens, the high rates of evaporation, the difficulty in capturing peak flows so they can be made available for cropping or livestock or other things. Uh, the same is, in, of course, true in the Limpopo. Much of the water in the Limpopo Basin falls in just a very few high-volume rainfall events. And if you can't capture it, it just goes washes off into the sea. If you can capture more of it, you can produce more with the water that you have. Very often, we find that technical solutions to improve water productivity can't make any headway unless there's some institutional change to support it. And that institutional change won't get anywhere unless there's a policy framework which encourages it. Um, I can think of a rather interesting example in the Ganges. Uh, there's a technology where people, instead of being damaged by floodwaters coming down the river, can use the floodwaters collectively as a community for aquaculture. But to do that, they have to change institutions. The institution is to allow collective farming and management and use of, of the resource during the wet season, the flooding season, and revert back to individual plot ownership in the dry season. What we need to make progress is uh, effective partnerships. We found that science alone is not the solution. Technology alone is not the solution. We find that we get unexpected benefits from unexpected partnerships. This is why we've been very open to innovative and unusual kind of partnerships and projects where we find the skills that people bring in make all the difference in the world in being successful.